All right, well, let's get started. Uh, glad you're here. Thank you for coming back as we finalize our class. Uh, I just made it in myself uh, five, two, three minutes ago. We had a flat tire. So, man, I forgot how you can sweat when you're trying to change a flat tire and you're in a hurry, of course, right? So I'm over there cranking and the family's helping. and. Uh, they need to make those, the bases of the, the jack like wider because I'm about to pull the tire out and the car is like, nah, pff, like oh, come on, right? So we crank it up again, but, but we made it. So we're here. Uh, I was about to call people, an Uber, I don't know, something. Uh, see if somebody could fill in and teach the class. But so. We're finalizing, today is the last uh, of the series. Uh, next Wednesday, we have VBS, open house. So we have everybody, I think, starts at the auditorium and then uh, we go from there. And then the following Wednesday, we start what we call our summer series. And uh, I think all adult, maybe even high school, all adult for sure meet in the auditorium through the summer quarter and we'll have guest speakers and we're going to talk about the kingdom the kingdom of heaven through emphasis on the parable so i think it'll be really insightful and interesting um, so the ten commandments we walk through each one of those the idea of the ten commandments within the broader uh, torah or covenant uh, ten of 613 commandments play a role in establishing a people group uh, a kingdom that was to be and this is in exodus 19 to be a holy nation a nation of of priesthood a priesthood nation that they were to be set apart from a world of other nations that had their other beginning creation stories that had their other gods real or imagined and they reflected those realities but within that broken dysfunctional family of humanity God called out one people one people group not to just be uh, ethnically bound to them and then the rest you know eventually burns in hell kind of concept but to, through them through them to be an exclusive people related, connected in a covenant partnership with Yahweh only, thus being priestly, in other words, interceding between God and a broken humanity, a broken humanity and God. And the Ten Commandments, as the heart of it, had a role in making that, that possible. You know, what does that community look like? And we walked through each one of those and made connections with uh, other parts of the story, the New Testament, and so forth. Uh, last class, we kind of try to put all that together, how even today, in Jesus, we are still to be priestly. Okay? We are to be a priestly nation, all the way connecting back to Adam and Eve, that we're to be royal priests. And an imagery that repeated through different parts of the story, and had really that heart there in uh, Israel and in Jesus were to be priestly, which means what? We are to work. Work, uh, in the word we highlighted there, in the word in Genesis, avad, to work the ground is also the word used describing the priestly duties, which literally meant work, service, and worship, right? Work, service, and worship as part of their interceding process between God and Israel, Israel and God. And we are to do that in Jesus. We're to be an interceding community between God and the broken world, the broken world and God. So we're not to hide behind, you know, religious buildings or warm the pews only. We're to be out there working, serving, and worshiping through how we live and we connected that with Romans 12 and some other things. Today I want to kind of wrap all that up in the idea of Jesus, right? We've already been making connections, but Jesus. Let's start with uh, 1 Timothy, and we're going to 
take the scenic route and connect to Jesus here. But 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14 through 16. So Paul uh, is writing to Timothy. Timothy is kind of like a, uh, a child in the faith. It's a, he's a partner. He's a, the son in the faith there with, with Paul in this journey. And Paul has Timothy in Ephesus where you can read all about that, uh, how that started in Acts 19. We just had Sunday morning wrap up Ephesians, right? And so we've been looking at details there. And Ephesians is at the heart talking about how to be this uniquely united new humanity in Jesus. That's the heart of what Paul is writing to the Ephesians. And so Timothy is there to help that process along because it's, it was one with many challenges, uh, down ethnicity, religion, cultural differences, difficulties, uh, socioeconomic. So how do we bridge all those dividing topics out there and in Jesus unite as a new humanity? Welcome to Ephesians. Well, what role is Timothy to have in that process? Well, in summary, here's what Paul reminds Timothy of what this new community, this new humanity is to be. So chapter 3, verse 14 through 16. Although I hope to come to you soon, I'm writing you these instructions so that if I am delayed, you will know how people, or the idea of there's that community, ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the gathered ones of the living God. Church, okay, that's literally what it means, the gathered one. Okay, God's household here has layers. It's not, the most obvious layer is a family, right? We're a family, you can read that in John's uh, ch uh, account of the gospel, chapter one. In Jesus, we've been adopted into his family, not out of ethnicity, or biological ties, but in Christ. So he's already making the point that it's a, com it's a family unto all humanity, right? not just Jewish ethnicity. So there's that layer. But the concept of God's house meant the, the tabernacle, later became the temple. God's house was the temple, the temple in Jerusalem and the temple in Jerusalem was the connecting point of two realities. It was connecting the heavens and earth, the world, the cosmic reign of God, and this physical existence. So it was, think of the realms, like, you know, Thor and, you know, the realms. Okay, that's where they connect. That's where they connect, in Jesus. I mean, yes, in Jesus. But at the temple, before Jesus, the temple. And so to be God's house is to be the connecting point of two worlds. Right? It's to be the connecting point of two worlds. So we now, as individuals, where the Spirit of God comes upon us at baptism, and as a community, we are the connecting point of two worlds. How cool is that? What an amazing responsibility. Uh, you know, but I, I have conversations with students at OC. I don't know what, you know, what God wants me to major in. And I, I'm, I'm not sure I'm between nursing and psychology. And so I'll ask them questions like, oh, tell me your interests, you know, kind of. And then inevitably I'm like, you know what? I think I can say this. In good conscience, I don't think God cares. Because regardless of your job, you are the connecting point of two worlds. And you are priestly. In whatever sphere of influence you, you so choose, let me flip a coin. Because that's what really matters. We're this connecting point of two worlds. And here he's talking to them as this community that connects two worlds by calling them the church, the gathered ones, become the house of God, the, the symbol, symbolism of the temple. And thus, as a community, we are the connecting point of two worlds. We are 
the priestly responsibilities that Adam and Eve were to have, that Moses had, that Aaron had, that David had, like there's reoccurring symbolism, that Israel was to have, that Jesus truly had, and we are to have. Okay? But Paul says here, uh, I'm coming to you. When I get there, I'm going to help out. Read the letter, Ephesians. It's about how to be this community. But until then, you need to play a role in helping them be that community. All right? The instructions I'm giving you is so that you can help them do that right. And then he goes on and articulates that a little further. Because we are the pillar and foundation of the truth. Verse 16, um, beyond all question, the mystery from which true godliness springs is great. He appeared in the flesh, was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels, was preached among the nations, was uh, believed on in the world, and was taken up in glory. He, there's so many layers he's connecting here with Isaiah and some other imageries, but even the... Uh, Genesis. But what is he saying? Jesus is God in the flesh. He's those two worlds truly put together. And because he's been approved and, and vindicated and, and made that possible, we, in him, as we gather around him, we are to reflect that image, to reflect that purpose, that reality. And we do so by being this truth. And listen, don't hear me minimize, don't hear me dismiss it. Uh, I think Paul, uh, Paul, Tim, I'm sure he'll be happy to know I thought of him as Paul for a second, that Tim, uh, he wrote a, an article about this Sunday maybe, uh, the idea of like, what are we to be known for? Acapella music? That's, that's, there's, there's a role for that. Are we to be known for, you know, women's role? That's not what he means here when he says the truth. The truth is he's talking about Jesus embodying these two worlds, being the connecting point, being the access point of a broken world to God and connecting God to a broken world. That truth we gather around and are to reflect. See, it's much more, it's grander and more cosmic than being known for a cappella music. Okay, all right, so let's go now to Jesus. I feel like we, we should have Jesus here in this. Uh, Jesus, Matthew chapter 5, 5, 6, and 7, what somebody somewhere in history uh, entitled it, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew, at the end of chapter 4, says it's the articulation of the good news of the kingdom. Okay, so Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is what does it look like to be this new humanity, this, these gathered ones around the, the cosmic connecting point of two worlds, Jesus. And so he's going to expound upon how do we live that out. Similar thing that Paul does just in to a different uh, specific audience there in Ephesians and all any of the New Testament writers are unfolding all this. The end of chapter 5, starting there verse 23 on, and this is important, he's speaking to the nobodies of that world. I want you to think of, to borrow a phrase, the deplorables, okay? Those people, as that world would categorize it, the nobodies. And nobody's as in many layers. Eth ethnically, they were considered very nothing. The, the social economically, down at the bottom. Uh, political power, zero. Like the folks, okay? The oppressed, the neglected, the rejected, the, 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 the bottom. He's speaking to them. To them. And chapter 5, he begins with this vision of what does it look like to have the favor of God. Have you ever thought about that? We could call it the American dream. What, 
what would that, what does that dreamy existence look like, right? What, what does it mean to be successful, to have, to reach the dream, to have the favor of the gods, or whatever way you want to phrase it, it you, you, to be happy, that kind of concept. And then he goes on this weird description of things that don't sound very favorable. You know, he talks about poverty and he uses words like mourning and meek. When was the last time you heard anybody say, when I grow up, I want to be meek? <laughs> you know, or say that in a, in a like a super successful person or, or in an athlete. You know what I appreciate the most about him? He's just so meek. Just gets that football and meekness. Come, I mean, come on, like said no one ever. <laughs> Uh, he talks about hunger and thirst. He talks about merciful, which was not considered a great thing. He talks about purity and he talks about peacemaking, which is a lovely hashtag. Blessed are the peacemakers, you know. Okay. For you older people, that means hashtag. All right. So <laughs> not everybody's in tune with the generations like me. The, uh, so... <laughs> What, it's, it's a lovely concept, except when you're saying that to a people that have been oppressed for 600 years and were currently oppressed. Blessed, the ones that have the favor of God are those that are promoting peace in a world where you've been oppressed for 600 years. And you will be called children of God. Yeah, that, that really wasn't trending uh, very well. And then he talks about you have God's favor when you're persecuted. I'm sorry, what, what kind of dream is that? Is, is that the Israel dream? I, I think I might like the American dream better. This, this is weird, right? So he already, he's speaking to the nobodies, using kind of a very mis, misery type of existence uh, to talk about the favor of God. So it's already this upside down concept. And then he says to them, verse 14, you, remember the you here, you are the light of the world. Okay, this isn't just like, let your little light shine, you know, you know I'm talking about VBS songs and all that, uh, which is lovely in, in, in illustrations, like if you turn off the light, you know, turn it all off and it's dark, and then, but you can be a candle here in the corner and you're like, oh, you know, you can let your light shine. All nice. But this is so much profound and cosmic. Um, in Genesis 1, it says there that God created the heavens and the earth, right? The two cosmic realities. The realm of God and this physical existence. And what did this existence look like? It was chaotic, void, murky, waterish, primordial mess. And which the concept of waters in the creation story of Egypt, which was at the time, it was a competing creation story, and that of the Babylonians, which were a competing story at the time, this creation story of Genesis is in dialogue with that, not evolution, which is the last hundred years, okay? It's a direct dialogue with that mess. And the watery image in both of those creation stories, that's what the world starts out with. The watery abyss. Some of you are like, I love water, and you splash around and you want to go to the beach. Okay, watery abyss to them was this imagery of like, you ever watch like movies with sharks and stuff? And, and like Jaws or where... It's kind of late at night and people are splashing around in the water and you just see the, the music. Dum, 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 dum. And then there, you know there's something there. You're about to be eaten. You know they're about to be eaten. They should know they're about to be eaten, but then they're eaten. Okay, it's this kind of dark, murky, scary, death-ish. That's how they thought of the beginnings of the universe. So the two verses there, chapter 1, verse 1, verse 2, there's a compare and contrast. There's the watery mess, and it's scary because darkness is over it. Okay, and that imagery is found in these other creation stories. 
the gods of Egypt and uh, Babylon, they come out of that primordial messness kind of. So that existed first. They come out of that and then they start dealing with that scariness. This creation story has God. And the, that uncertainty, dark mess, abyss kind of thing, it's not scary because there's darkness there, but then the very next verse is, and the Spirit of God hovered over it. And then what, what does it say next? And then there was light. So the very presence of God, and that's the sun, the moon, all that is like in verse 4. So he's not saying, in, and God created the sun. He's saying, God is the light unto that dark existence. And so now, what seems to be a symbol of death and uncertainty and chaos and scariness, because of the presence of God's spirit and light, becomes the waters that start to like bring life unto a garden. So when he says here, you are the light of the world, he's saying, read Genesis. I give you that power because I am God with you, which is what Matthew introduces Jesus as in chapter 1, verse 24. I am God with you. So what the world looks like, this chaotic mess, have you ever watched the news? Oh, God help us, right? What a horrible mess. I must be getting old and emotional because I find myself wanting to cry way too often. Can anybody, Barry, you know, you know what I'm talking about, right? So, yeah, thanks. Like I was, we, we got a, I got a text and he was somewhere talking about a, a child who has brain tumor. I'm like, come on, what horrible world are we in? Like, it's scary, and it's dark, and uncertain. It's kind of that watery mess of the ancient world symbol. God, bring light to that. Transform that into life and better. And you know what he's saying here? I am. How? By being present, God with us. And then being with you. So you can be the light of the world. You can be that transformative presence. Once again, who's this you? The poor, the neglected, the nobody. How are they going to make the world better? Because we all know it takes money, power, status, political parties, politicians. Oh, no, it doesn't. It takes the presence of God and the people that gather around God with us and Jesus. Okay, so you are the light of the world. And then move down a little bit. Verse 16. Um, they will see your good deeds, right? Here's us moving into that world. They'll see the good deeds and they'll give glory to the Father in, the, in heaven. Once again, to the cosmic ruler of the universe. Because his rule is breach. It's like coming into the darkness by the very presence of light. Okay, so what makes the waters, this chaotic doomsday mess of uncertainty, or the waters as a source of life? Presence of God, which you and I get to reflect, which, by the way, we were created to reflect. Okay, you then get to, uh, to Revelation, and there it's describing this restored Garden of Eden kind of imagery. And then it says, John, the, John the visionary, John the revealer there says that the presence of God was the light. So he's not saying now we got a better son. He's saying God is the light of that new garden. He, his presence. And I don't think he just means like, it's just better wattage in Jesus, you know, that you can turn on the light than the sun. It's his presence is an existence of life, an eternal life. So by then it's all better. All right, okay. But, yeah, let, okay, hold that thought. Verse 17. 
If Jesus says this, is because people were thinking it. So, he mentions, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Why would Jesus, it didn't sound random. You're the light of the world. Oh, by the way, listen. I didn't come to abolish the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, the Torah, the backstory, the, the, the covenant with God's people, Israel, Mount Sinai, the 613 laws, the Ten Commandments. I didn't come to abolish that. Why would he say that? Because that was one of the leading accusations the religious leaders had against him. Oh, you're just some podunk boy from the sticks who's like claiming that we don't need any of that anymore. That we... That was the old way, you know. Now I'm here with something more enlightened. And just like, no, I didn't, I'm, I'm not replacing that. <laughs> Have you ever heard the statement, we're not under the old law? I understand the sentiment behind it. And I agree with what's being tried to say, but very poorly articulated. It, there's not an old and new. It's, it's one narrative. It's one storyline with different moments of the story, that in Jesus, find the fulfillment. It's not that Jesus throws out the Ten Commandments and say, I got better ones. It's Jesus saying, I am what the Ten Commandments was trying to do. So he goes on. Let's, let's, let's work this out. Uh, verse 18. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, in, in other words, until these realms are but one, right? Until they're currently overlapping, connected in a few things like Jesus and, and us. Okay, but until this is all one reign, one thing of God on the other side of eternity, until then, not the smallest letter not the least stroke of the pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Does that sound like it's old? We're done with it. So are we supposed to go like get little lammy and sacrifice it Sunday morning? <laughs> Bring a lamb, walk it up to you know the front there when Tim's about to preach. I think we're, we got an approval. Y'all can do that. Uh, <laughs> Just, you know, oh, I will be filming it. Um, yeah, are, are we supposed to do that? And then there's all like these kosher laws and we can't have ham sandwiches anymore. I'm sorry, you know. And get, no, hold that thought. That, that's not what it means. And I think that's what people mean. We're not under the law. And that, to that, it's partly true. Uh, verse 19, therefore... Anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Once again, does that sound like Jesus is replacing something? If it is, Jesus found the weirdest, worst way to articulate it ever. And the most confusing Opposite way of saying it. Uh, verse 20. For I tell you that unless your right doing, right, your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. That sounds even more intense. That sounds even more intense. Okay, let's put this in perspective. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law they were basically like your most conservative group of religious people you can think of and the lawyers of lawyer-like attitude about the law. So it was a world, the, the Jewish politics slash religious world was super divided. You had, you had my right, your right, okay. So you had, on the right here, you had the Pharisees. Right? And the lawyers, okay, the teachers of the law. Then you had a little bit more over here on the left, you kind of had the counterparts, the Sadducees, right? They're a little more, they were a smaller group, more money and power, so they kind of, you gotta be a little more flexible with some things. Um, then you had 
Where am I at? Okay. Further right, you had the uh, Zealots. They were an active, rebellious movement who, in the name of God and of God and country, right, Israel, they were actively, militarily fighting for freedom of the oppression of Rome. So you had the Zealots, which one of Jesus' inner group was Simon the Zealot. That worldview, okay? Then over here you had the Lestai, which were like social banditry with a political cause. So they would take from the rich and give to the poor because the rich had too much and the poor were being oppressed. So they would take and they would give to the poor. So don't think like you're somebody still in a chicken. Okay? These were a, milita- uh, or a politically minded, religious motivated group of people who thought the world was, had too much inequality and they were doing something about it. Okay. The zealots, to some, wasn't far enough. And so you had the Sakari, which were those of the dagger, and guess what those folks went around doing? With the dagger. You with me? Okay. So, and then some other, ver- the Herodians, there's, there's other groups. So Jesus says, you want to be a part of this new humanity, the kingdom of heaven. Chapter 4, verse 17, Jesus' little slogan, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. You want to be a part of that cool movement? Yeah, yeah, Jesus, we love, you know, social Jesus. Okay, you want to be a part of that? Your righteousness has to surpass this very intense group over here. Or you won't be a part of this family. How can you be more lawyery, is that a thing, than lawyers? How can you be more legalistic than the definition of legalism? Like... And he's speaking to like uneducated, backwoodsy people that didn't even know how to read and write. They're, they're the nobodies of the world. Like, so who's in? First of all, don't think of righteousness there as just doing right things. Okay? Or like, you got, you got to be more with the law than the most intense folks with the law. So don't think law that way. Think of what he's saying here is righteousness as in doing right by one's relationships. Unless you do more right by relationships than the most, some of these most conservative legalistic folks, you won't be reflecting what it means to be the connecting point of two worlds and you really won't be that light unto a darkness. Because somehow, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, the way they approached it, they were actually promoting the darkness. Remember in John, Jesus says, you reflect your father who is the devil. I mean, you know, how more offensive can you be? Can we go back to like social justice Jesus? Because that's kind of intense. He's, you're, workers of hell he's not saying that to the like the pagan overlords of rome you know and that he's saying that to the religious leaders that too many were the like what it meant to be right in the eyes of god but there's something about their approach that is not it's not being a light unto a dark world it was being darkness and so he says, Jesus says, you, you're going to have to do your relationships better. So it can't be legalism, because how can you be more legalistic than legalism? I mean, I think he picked those two groups on purpose, because they were the ones actually instigating his own death, right? So, so I'm thinking they're not doing relationships well. So Jesus here then goes on and gives six different examples, which we don't have time to cover, and we've covered some already because he will do this contrast, compare and contrast, which I think he's trying to connect you with that two imageries of water in Genesis 1, where one can be unto death and the other one can be a source of life. And what's the difference? The way the Pharisees and Sadducees are approaching it, which is actually promoting that dark abyss, or the way 
the Spirit of God, the light of the world is hovering over that, which is then transforming that into a source of betterment in life and so forth. So he uses this compare and contrast. You have heard it say, and those that would be saying it were the religious leaders who were teaching Israel how to be God's people. So you have heard it say from the agents of darkness, thou shalt not commit adultery, or thou shalt not murder, or uh, what else? Uh, do not break an oath. Uh, so all these different things. And then he comes on and says, but I tell you, who's that I? God with us. It's the Spirit of God hovering over the waters. It's the light of the world that's here to empower you to be the light of I say to you, and then he goes on to something more, something deeper, something fulfilled. So here's the point. Uh, a ten, one of the Ten Commandments, what makes a commandment something that leads to betterment? Or the same commandment that leads to broken relationships, oppression, legalism. The commandment's the same. The imagery of the waters is the same. It's the light of God. It's the presence of God. It's the heart of what, it's the right spirit as you approach that commandment. So, thou shalt not commit adultery can be used as a way to like have people stoned in the market. Or, anybody read uh, Jesus' account of interacting with that woman caught in adultery? What does his version of that? It's the same, ver it's the same st statement, but what is he addressing? What is he promoting? It's, a, it's, it's something that changes the world. Versus here, it just propagates violence, oppression, hatred. So sometimes we get stuck on, but see, I quoted the verse right. Well, good for you. You know who also does that? In, say, Matthew 4? The devil. So it's not that you just pull out that commandment. It's like, oh, look, God said it. Then you use it to beat on people with it. It's not just the wording to be right. It's the heart of that. It's what that was trying to accomplish. It's what God, at the essence of it, is trying to transform. So one approach leads to persecution, to violence, to hatred, to exclusion. To The other leads to transformation, to forgiveness, to betterment, to right relationships. You have heard it say, thou sh you know... Uh, Love your enemy or love your neighbor and hate your enemy. It's right there, it's already Jesus is making the point. The, the, the idea of love your, your neighbor has been used as a measuring stick to then hate your enemy. And who's teaching that? The religious leaders. You can go back to Leviticus 19, which we already have, and past classes here, so I won't go back and read it, but Leviticus 19 talks about loving your, your, loving your neighbor. For 1,500 years, people discussed at length, who is my neighbor? Is that already not the wrong approach? See how that, the very command of God, love your neighbor, is already used to exclude. Jesus says, Actually, go check Leviticus 19, because he says, you have heard it say, love your neighbor. So he's nodding to that, but hate your enemy. But I tell you, and we're here at the end of chapter 5, love your enemies. Pray for those that persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. See how he keeps, he's connecting it back to Genesis the commandment of love your neighbor was not meant to be used as a way to exclude people from that neighbor. 
Jesus is brilliant. When he tells a story to illustrate this point, anybody remember the Good Samaritan? It's become a lovely children's, uh, you know, little story, good VBS theme. It's a deep, like, offensive, mind-blowing, like, shaking the foundations of that society story. Because the great hero of that story is a non-Jew. Worse, he is, he's Jewish. There's a whole 700 year worth of backstory of why the Samaritans and the Jews hated each other. And then he goes further and calls him the good Samaritan. And who's the other bad characters in the story? Religious leaders. Have we, I'm going to just throw it out. Have we, as the chosen ones, the people of God, the connecting world, point of two worlds, the light unto a dark, broken world, have we been using, by any way or another, the word of God to beat on people, to promote hellish things? Yes, you can promote hellish things with the word of God. Or your use of it. Once again. Satan, chapter 4, the religious leaders. It is possible. Listen, it's not enough to quote it correctly. We're people of the book. Good. I'm glad. I understand what that meant. But we got to be more. We got to be people of the kingdom of heaven. That's more than just people of the book. It's people who are using. The message, the light, the story of God to truly impact the world to better. Instead of just being a, a different arm of, say, politics. Not that that ever happens. So, we are still today to be the connecting point of two worlds for betterment. Think of it like just a more practical illustration. Uh, a medical doctor who takes uh, their expertise unto a very remote part of the world that has nothing, no running water, some potent village in the matter of nothing. What, what are they there to do? Bring healing. Bring betterment. Does that make sense? That's word to be that. That connecting of two worlds. A broken, sick world to the source of healing and betterment. We were created to do that in Genesis. Israel was empowered and called to do that. And in Jesus, that is finally fulfilled as we gather around that fulfillment, Jesus, God with us, to then reflect that reality. Thank you for being here. And we'll just be a light of the world. Thanks for coming.